Okay, uh, class, well, um, we have um, another great legacy lecture for you this morning. Um, before I start, does anyone have any comments? Okay, I'm gonna start sharing my screen and introducing Dr. Zola to you. Okay, so this is legacy lecture five, uh, Dr. R. Robert, I think Thomas Zola from the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. Um, and he, he, Tom is also a key night champion of sustainability and a hero of the chemical dimension of sustainability. You, you cannot imagine how big a burden a tiny group of people in the world carry over endocrine disruption. I think it's fair to say Tom knows everybody who's done significant work in this area. And I know practically everybody. And it's the world really does depend for great leadership, typically, uh, particularly when it's got to change a lot, because no one likes to change on a handful of people. And uh, Tom Zola is an absolutely critical person in, in setting you guys up for the change you have to have if you're going to uh, uh, continue with families, etc. So it's a very special day. You get to meet. Dr. Dr. Zola, world-class research scientist who works on understanding how thyroid hormones control development and how and the thyroid um, uh, has fewer people working on it than, for example, estrogens, which is the major thing. Androgens have fewer people as well. And Dr. Dr. Zola's Mr. Thyroid really is Dr. Thyroid, really, when you get down to it. A control development and how endocrine disruptors hijack thyroid hormone activity. There's an absolutely critical element of neurological development. Dr. Zola is also a world leading interpretive scholar in the building of the field of endocrine disruption. Dr. Zola can talk to people across disciplines in very persuasive ways. As one of the most generous and self effacing scholars I've met in my four decades of research, uh, and my more than two decades of interacting with the endocrine disruption community, Dr. Zola is one of our most widely trusted and calmest voices in analyzing the big picture of endocrine disruption. You know, 20 years ago, I would get really upset about these things. I'd get mad. And Dr. Zola probably gets mad too, but he's much better <laughs> at keeping the lid on than I was. I've got good at it through... Uh, through years and maybe just getting older. Dr. Zola has stepped up to the plate on numerous occasions to take on heavy burdens of public service, aimed at bringing scholarly based common sense thinking to the United States government and its regulatory agencies, uh, to the endocrine society and to governments worldwide. What follows the brief personal history of Dr. Zola's career took shape that I asked him to write for you and I'm not sure what happened to the rest of that sentence. But before I do that, I'm going to just review the last couple of years of his publication so that you can see the kind of work that he does. All right, so here's one. And this is, this is full of uh, really critical um, leaders in endocrine disruption. And sure enough, here you go, consensus on the key characteristics of endocrine disruption chemicals as a basis for for hazard identification. So he's really getting down, well, what does an endocrine disruptor look like? Or at least that group is. Here's another one. Maternal cord and three-year-old child serum thyroid hormone, con thyroid hormone concentrations in the health outcomes and the measures of the environmental study. Maternal serum perfluoroalkyl substance mixtures and thyroid hormone concentrations in maternal and cord zero, zero, the home study. Removing critical gaps in chemical test methods by developing new assays for the identification of thyroid hormone system disrupting chemicals, the Athena project. The use and misuse of historical controls in regulatory toxicology, lessons from the Clarity BPA study. That is a story. It's a disgrace to see the F FDA's behavior towards uh, information uh, 
obviously, uh, uh, it, it's just it's just really sad to watch. The FDA is um, kindly put incompetent towards endocrine disruptors. Thresholds and endocrine disruptors, an endocrine society policy perspective. Clarity BPA, bisphenol A or propylthiouracil on thyroid function and effects in the developing male and female rat brain. The Clarity study was a $30 million study involved, meant to bring government agencies and the researchers together. And it should have, it's just the government agencies um, uh, behaved appallingly. Comparative analyses of the 12 most abundant PCB congeners detected in human maternal serum. You've seen what PCBs can do for activity in the thyroid hormone receptor and ryanodine receptor. So you read about this and these impacts on um, behavior and IQ and things like that in our stolen future. And what you're seeing here is more advanced science analyzing that. Dibutyl phthalate exposure from mesalamine medications and serum thyroid hormones in men. Predictors of urinary phthalate, and this is just 19, 2020 and 2019 that I'm going through here. Predictors of urinary phthalate biomarker concentrations in postmenopausal women. And this one uh, should be thyroid hormones and neurobiological functions among adolescents chronically exposed to groundwater with geogenic arsenic in Bangladesh. Update on activities in endocrine disruption research and policy. That's for, uh, I think, the endocrine society. Uh, urinary concentrations of phthalate biomarkers and weight change among postmenopausal women, a prospective cohort study. Urinary phthalate biomarker concentrations and menopausal breast cancer risk. Well, that's the last couple of years of Dr. Zola's publication. So I asked Dr. Zola how you view yourself as a sustainability leader for the chemical enterprise. And this is how he responded. The key issues that I trained as a basic experimental biologist, uh, a neuroendocrinologist. I was an undergrad from 74 to 77 at Indiana University in a program that was geared to experimentalists. The course in endocrinology I took convinced me that this is what I wanted to do. At Oregon State University, I worked with Frank Moore on a very innovative project to begin to understand and inter the interaction between steroid hormones and neuropeptides in the regulation of reproduction and, and amphibian. I was then an NRC fellow at the National Institute of Mental Health in Bethesda from 83 to 88, and the lab that was led by Julie Axelrod, helping to develop the technique of in situ hybridization to measure target mRNAs in single cells. This technique allowed me to, uh, you'll see techniques coming up, transformational techniques at the, in the early stages of the careers of many of the people that we, if not all, <laughs> most anyway, of the legacy lectures that we've seen. Techniques are really important. The technique allowed me to answer questions about how the nervous system controls hormones in relation to reproduction and development. During my first academic position at the University of Missouri School of Medicine, I began to evaluate the role of thyroid hormone in the control of cerebral cortex development. I took this project and interest with me to the University of Massachusetts in 1994. And in 1996, I was invited to participate in EPA's Endocrine Disruptor Screening and Testing Advisory Committee, EDSTAT. Um, and so this, was the government realizing it had to get serious about endocrine disruptors and it despite the best of intentions it's fair to say that it's never really succeeded this committee met in washington about every six weeks over an 18 month period and was my introduction to ecds edc and to, reg to the regulatory domain this 
experience led to an inflection point in my research and my efforts. And so now we're gonna show you some of the things, these efforts, these critical efforts, um, where somebody takes on a very large burden to try to help the country, the regulatory agencies, the people understand uh, uh, matters of great urgency and importance in science. So from 94 to 96, Dr. <coughs> Zola was helping to develop methods to identify EDCs in, in the EATS domain. That's uh, um, uh, andro estrogen, androgen, thyroid, and steroidogenic uh, modalities, as they say. In 1999 to 2002, um, EPA's research uh, perchlorate, uh, 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 where Dr. Uh, Zola reviewed EP's work to identify the public risk of sodium perchlorate. Believe it or not, perchlorate is a, is a thyroid EDC. It's astonishing that you would never expect this, but apparently it is. And um, th it, that's just an amazing fact that a tetrahedral chlorine compound with four oxygens uh, would be impacting the thyroid system. 2004 to 2007, EPA's Chartered Science Advisory Board, the, where, where uh, Dr. Zola for, a bit, for those years provided science advice. You can, pretty, you, you can map this on to the presidents that were uh, present at the time. These are, these are democratic, uh, well, not actually, I guess that's, we, we've got both uh, parties. Uh, in power, chair of EPA's environmental uh, health and something committee, uh, where he reviewed ToxCast, which is the way the EPA was building up data to try to uh, analyze things. 2010 to 12, uh, un uh, United Nations Environmental uh, Program and the World Health o Organization uh, wrote this very critical report, State of the Science of Endocrine Disrupting Chemicals. And then in 2010, Dr. Zola led the writing of the first endocrine disruption chemical statement for the endocrine society. I'm very proud of the fact, by the way, that the ACS, American Chemical Society, had the first such statement. Um, I was uh, on the committee. I, I actually, actually wrote it, um, and then it was tweaked a bit. Uh, but I'm pretty sure that I've got rid of it now, uh, based on the, the way the ACS has changed over the years. In 2010 to the present, Endocrine Society Task Forces and Committees on Endocrine Disrupting Chemicals. And then in 2013 to 15, United Na Nations Environmental uh, Program, SciChem, Strategic Approach for International Chemicals Management. So an attempt internationally to begin to manage chemicals much better than we do. So Dr. Hol Zola holds major awards from the wider world in his own institution, the Endocrine Society Laureate Award for Outstanding Public Service. Because of the time, I won't read that, but that's a really, really important award. The UMass Distinguished Community Engagement and Research Award, <coughs> the UMass Chancellor's Medal, uh, for research. Uh, the Samuel Conti Faculty Research Fellowship at the University of Massachusetts. And the Scientists of the Year by the Learning Disabilities Association. And that's uh, an award that has a long history and it has some names that you might recognize. For example, Herb Needleman. Uh, and Bernie Weiss, who um, has passed away, I believe, it was a, a phenomenal uh, endocrine disruption researcher and engaged in all sorts of things with deep, deep understanding of dioxin at the University of Rochester. Well, at this point, I'm going to stop screen sharing and ask Dr. Zola to take over and talk to, talk to you guys about um, the big picture. Well, <clears throat> thanks a lot, Terry, for, for a really generous introduction. Um, one of the things, one of the points um, that I think I'd like to make through this kind of story is that I didn't start out 
with an idea that I would be doing what I'm doing. I kind of, I, you know, I really pursued my interest, but also pursued um, a level of injustice that I couldn't ignore. And in fact, when I think about my career like that, I often think of Bob Seeger and his statement that I wish I didn't know now what I didn't know then. And um, so it's, it's um, you know, I just haven't been able to let it go. One of the points that I wanna make too is that societies are now harming their populations, that is you, with inadequate standards of chemical safety and these cozy connections with industry. And so I'm going to worry about that. And I'm going to begin with really what got me kind of hooked in this. And that is the, the EDSTAC proposal, which was adopted by the US EPA in their endocrine disrupting um, screening program. Now, if you look at this, this is tier one. If a chemical makes it through tier one and it's okay, it's not passed on to tier two, which is a more, you know, they say it's more robust, but within the thyroid domain, it's really not robust. It's actually a duplication of what's going on here. First of all, there are these in vitro assays, estrogen, androgen, steroidogenesis. There's nothing here related to thyroid hormone. <clears throat> Then in vivo, there's this uterotrophic assay. This is all, you know, female and male reproduction. There's the pubertal rat, male and female, where they measure serum thyroid hormone levels. So that's it. That for tier one, if a chemical, um, you know, isn't really an overt toxic agent, it's going to make it through here. Now, you know, there's two things about this, this situation. So from 96 to 98, we worked on this program. Then the, the EPA spent 10 years validating it. Now that's 10 years and $100 million it took to validate it. Every one of these assays were available before EDSTAC and they were in use. So you know, essentially what happened was there was a law that was passed in 1996 that required the EPA to set up this endocrine disruptor screening program. But at the end of the day, industry had essentially achieved the goal of having no change. So that's one of the things that, that really got me going. I was so naive when I was on the ed stack that that I kind of got, um, my arguments weren't effective. So, so I wanna tell you about why these assays are ineffective at identifying chemicals that interfere with thyroid hormone and what the consequences of that, what those that consequences are. But to know this, I have to talk a little bit about what thyroid hormone does and how it does it. So I know this isn't a group of endocrinologists, <clears throat> but I want to try to give you a survey to just give you a sense of the issue here. So the first thing is, what are the symptoms of thyroid disease? Disease really means thyroid hormone or thyroid underactivity or overactivity. Now, Okay, so this is kind of a classic picture of what happens, what the symptoms are in adults of hypothyroidism, so an underactive thyroid or an overactive thyroid. I might add that uh, thyroid medications are the most prescribed drugs in this country. So this is a very, these are very common phenomena. It's also interesting because you can read all these symptoms here, but the problem is that it's quite variable. Two people with the same level of disease can oftentimes have completely non-overlapping symptoms. So it's, it's actually difficult 
Um, and I think it's often difficult to, to diagnose. Now, in development, it's fundamentally different. This is a situation called cretinism that's caused by a lack of iodine, a complete deficiency of iodine in the environment. And so this causes, uh, because iodine is required for thyroid hormone synthesis, this winds up producing a situation where a person is deprived of thyroid hormone both during development, but also after development. So this is a situation called, um, called cretinism that, that is kind of, that actually was prevalent in the US in the in quotes goiter belt. So Ohio has have low iodine and this was a problem. But there's also a situation called congenital hypothyroidism where the thyroid gland fails to develop. So a fetus in a euthyroid mother is pretty in quotes happy with respect to the thyroid gland, but once they're born, they have low thyroid hormone levels. Now this picture on the right here, you can see there, this kid is jaundiced. Also, you can see this kind of tongue pro, um, you know, sticking out here. And that's actually because the thyroid gland is attached to the back of the thumb or the, the tongue. And so the thyroid gland actually migrates during development. And if that migration fails, then the thyroid gland doesn't work. But if you detect this soon and give thyroid hormone replacement, this is a kid with congenital hypothyroidism that has been uh, treated with thyroid hormone. It's a, it'll be a lifelong thing. Now, the thing is before thyroid hormone levels began to be evaluated in every baby. So everybody in this class had thyroid hormone levels checked at birth. <clears throat> but before that test, the symptoms of congenital hypothyroidism wasn't detected clinically very quickly. One analysis of this kind of situation showed that if if the child was not detected or was detected before the end of three months, 78% of those would have an IQ greater than 85. Only 20% if they were detected and treated between three and six months and no child that was identified after seven months could reach an IQ of 85. So this is a lifelong problem. And in fact, today the system is, a, is actually slower than some of the systems in Europe. So in all developed countries, every baby born has thyroid hormone levels detected at birth. Um, in Finland, a friend of mine there was saying that they detect, they detect kids and uh, begin to treat within the first week. In the US, it's delayed for a variety of reasons. It's also controlled by the state so that the average IQ of kids with congenital hypothyroidism in the US is five to seven points below um, kids who don't have, that population of kids who don't have congenital hypothyroidism. Five to seven points on a population basis is actually pretty important. Another thing that's really important is that the effect of thyroid hormone, the clinical domains of you know, cognitive function is affected differently if the insult, if thyroid hormone insufficiency occurs at different times during development. So this is on the human side here, this is rats. I don't wanna focus on rats, but, but another issue here is you might imagine that the brain is kind of assembled in a linear fashion. You have to do one thing and then, then the next. It's like building a house. And if you miss a certain stage, you can't go back and, and recover that. So it's actually really <clears throat> important. Thyroid hormone is essential during development. Um, the symptoms of low or high thyroid hormone 
depend on the timing of that situation. That's actually doesn't fit well in a regulatory system that looks for consistency. So some toxicologists would argue that if, if um, a chemical interferes with thyroid hormone, then it should always have the same effect. But thyroid hormone insufficiency itself doesn't have the same effect. So um, we've had these kind of arguments. So how does thyroid hormone do what it does? Well, thyroid hormone T4 is the predominant hormone that's released from the thyroid gland. It's iodinated, and this is tetraiodothyronine. This is the predominant hormone that travels through the blood and it goes to tissues where there are enzymes called diiodin-1 iodine from the outer ring. This is the inner ring, this is the outer ring. Then this, this hormone is the biologically active hormone. T3 is what does the business of thyroid hormone, but T4 is what circulates, if that makes sense. So a lot of people consider this a pro-hormone, not the hormone itself. There's a big debate about that that's not really important for this. Other enzymes can are inner ring deiodinases that convert T4 to reverse T3, which is not biologically active. That's again, a matter of debate, but it's a little bit wonky. And T3 can be converted to T2. Now this conversion stops the signal. When T4 gets into a cell, it's converted to T3. And if that T3 stays forever, it creates a big problem for that cell. And so like any signal, there has to be an onset and an offset. Hormones have to cycle. They can't just go up and stay up. If you give a hormone tonically, essentially what you do is desensitize the system. This is one of the reasons that there are non-monotonic dose responses because you get high dose inhibition of hormone systems. This is, this is true for all hormones. So, so this kind of degradation from T3 to, to T2 is actually important. This is complicated here. The thyroid gland sits here. It's controlled by a hormone from the pituitary gland. Spits out T4 into the blood, which then gets deiodinated in cells and tissues where it acts on gene expression. So there's a lot of, there are a lot of proteins that are controlling both the synthesis, the transport and the action, the conversion metabolism and uptake in different cells. That's the main point of this, of that slide. To kind of recapitulate this issue in the brain. So T4, to some extent T3, but to much less an extent, T4 is taken up by specific transporters into glial cells. These, this is an astrocyte, a tanocyte. This, this uh, transporter MCT8 here brings T3 into the neuron where it can act on the nuclear receptor. <clears throat> Convert, I mean, T4, T4 is, controlling things like the development of oligodendrocytes of specific cell types within the brain that allow us to function. So, and in fact, there, there's a genetic defect in MCT8 that occurs in, it's rare, but, um, but it's not uncommon. And it's a big focus today. It produces a neurological deficit that's pretty severe. The point that I wanna make here is that these ligands, T4 and T3, interact directly with a bunch of proteins. These serum binding proteins that distribute thyroid hormone in the blood, thyroid hormone itself is somewhat <clears throat> lipophilic in the sense that it's, it's uh, you know, dissolution in aqueous media is low but also cellular transporters 
diiodinases, thyroid hormone receptors. So it's the same ligand that's interacting directly in an equilibrium situation with all of these different proteins. Once it gets into the nucleus, it, there, it's a very complicated procedure here that I don't really want to talk about it. Um, it's one of the things that has fascinated me the most about this system, and I've spent a lot of time studying this. But needless to say, it's controlling gene expression, which in a developmental context is pretty important. It's critical. So thyroid hormone does important things. If you don't have enough in development, <laughs> you wouldn't be sitting here listening to this. You would not be in college. Blood levels of thyroid hormone are important, but the machinery in tissues and cells control what thyroid hormone does. And that's critical. A regulatory system is focused only on thyroid hormone levels in the blood. It's going to miss chemicals that interfere at the tissue level. And of course, thyroid hormone T4 and T3 interact physically with all these proteins that are important. So what about industrial chemicals in the thyroid? So here's thyroid hormone here. Here's PCBs. There are also these diphenolic compounds with halogens associated with them. Here is polybrominated diphenyl ethers. It's even got an ether link, just like T4 itself. There's, you know, for example, tetrabromo di uh, diphenyl ether that looks a lot more like thyroid hormone than PCBs do. Um, here's triclosan, which is in, you know, toothpaste, for example, um, that's even hydroxylated. Again, you've got these diphenolic rings with an ether link and it's halogenated. And then bisphenol A, which is kind of an interesting molecule. I didn't think, uh, you know, I think of bisphenol A as an estrogen, not a thyroid hormone analog. But here, a friend of mine uh, who was just using, you know, computer simulations to dock molecules in the thyroid, um, thyroid receptor ligand binding domain showed this issue here. Also, one of the most prevalent flame retardants, especially in electronic devices, is, um, is tetrabromo bisphenol A. Uh, we're all contaminated with all of these chemicals. So I'm not showing you a lot of them, but I can guarantee that if you were to measure these chemicals in your blood, you would have them. If, <clears throat> you know, when women become pregnant, those fetuses are contaminated with these chemicals. These are all lipophilic enough so that one of the ways women get rid of these chemicals is by breastfeeding. So I gave that story once to a, to a Senate briefing and one of the people, one of the you know, Senate staff, staffers really took me to task because I made this point that that lactation is a delivery mechanism for these kind of hydrophobic chemicals. And she said, I'm giving a mixed message because we all know that breastfeeding is good. And my response was, I'm not talking to breastfeeding women. I'm talking to people who could make a difference. So if, if you're gonna tell me I'm giving a, you know, um, a mixed message, you're not doing your job. And I, I really think that this is one of the biggest problems we've got is a failure of um, government, people that work in government to actually take this seriously and understand their own role. So I've worked on PCBs and I just wanna talk about a couple of things here so that it gives you a sense of how the system is failing to identify these chemicals. So PCBs, their production was banned by legislation, not by regulation, in 1979 in the US. <clears throat> but we're all still contaminated with PCBs because when the production was banned, their use was not banned. 
So probably 50% of PCBs that were ever produced are still in, you know, still in the environment in use in a variety of ways. One, one of the ways that's kind of coming about now is that PCBs were used in the caulking of windows. It, it makes, especially in cold environments like Pittsburgh, um, you have caulking that was, that was made more malleable and less, less you know, sensitive to temperature changes by putting PCBs in there. <clears throat> They're still off gassing. And old buildings with, that were built in the 50s and 60s and haven't had their windows and caulking replaced still has a lot of PCBs in the atmosphere. This is um, kind of an old review of PCBs in mother's milk. And you can see these, le these levels here are parts per million. Uh, these are different cohorts. So these are studies of PCBs in populations, a variety of populations. In fact, the level of PCBs here are higher than the levels of PCBs I've used in, in uh, our rat work. Also, PCBs have been linked to changes in behavior uh, in children and also the size of the corpus callosum. There's um, this is a white matter bridge between the two hemispheres. And this is a thyroid dependent organ. So it's certainly, it's certainly consistent with the idea that PCBs can interfere with thyroid hormone action in the brain during development. Here's a, also a review that just, you know, he, these are all different cohorts from all over the world looking at the relationship between PCB exposure and cognitive function. You can see all these down arrows. It just simply means, except for <laughs> auditory threshold. So thyroid hormone is actually important for development of the inner ears as well as the retina. So, so it's showing that PCB exposure during development is consistently linked to reduce cognitive function. Now, is that related to thyroid hormone and thyroid hormone levels? Here's a review of a number of epidemiological studies trying to find the link between PCB exposure and thyroid hormone levels. And there's nothing really obvious here. Some do, some don't. It's kind of a mixed bag. There's a lot of reasons for that. Um, but I think one of them is that, that chemicals that, that affect brain development don't always have an effect on thyroid hormone levels in blood, but that doesn't mean it doesn't affect thyroid hormone action in tissues. Our first experiment in this is kind of shown here. So <clears throat> as PCB concentration went up, thyroid hormone levels went down in rat pups during development. You would expect to see canonical changes in the brain that are consistent with low thyroid hormone. We've looked at a lot of these, but one that I'll show you is just a gene that we know is regulated by thyroid hormone in specific brain regions, not in other brain regions, but just in specific places. What we find is that PCB exposure increased the expression of this gene only in areas of the brain that we know are regulated by thyroid hormone. Now, over the years, that, that became kind of a fascination. Over the years, we showed that some PCBs, like this coplanar PCB, can interact <clears throat> with receptors in the nucleus that control the expression of an enzyme, CYP1A1, that can hydroxylate specific non-coplanar PCBs. Those in turn can bind to and activate the thyroid hormone receptor and regulate target genes. Now, there's, there's, there's a whole lot we could talk about, but what this really means is that <clears throat> these PCBs are interfering with the coordinated 
um, regulation of gene expression during development. If you turn on a gene before its time, that's just as bad as inhibiting the expression of that gene when it's, when it's time. So the conclusions here is that <clears throat> we propose this two-step mechanism. We've got absolute proof in cell culture. We've got strong evidence in animals because as soon as you put PCBs in an animal, you don't really know what it's doing. You can, you can look at measures that are consistent with your hypothesis, but we've also got evidence in humans in term placenta that are all fully consistent with this two-step mechanism. So chemical effects <clears throat> on the blood test of thyroid hormone don't predict what's happening in the body, or I'll say don't always predict. If we didn't already know that PCBs are neurotoxic and that they interfere with thyroid hormone action, the endocrine disruptor screening pro would likely fail to identify these chemicals as EDCs or as neurotoxicants. So when you read about the EDSP on the EPA website, it makes it sound like it's a 21st century panacea that's going to protect you. And it's not. It's primitive, it's outdated, it's, it simply wouldn't pick up chemicals that we know are harming us today. So that comes to the Athena program. So in Europe, they're actually beginning to take this seriously. They've, there's, this is a large funding program called Horizon 2020. There are a number of projects, the one that I'm involved with is called Athena, I forget what the acronym stands for, but it's, it's got 12 different laboratories in seven different countries. I'm associated with the, with the group in Sweden to come up with better endpoints to complement uh, current assays that look at thyroid hormone levels in the blood. So so one of the things that regulators in Europe are struggling with is what does it mean if thyroid hormone levels are changed, but we don't have any measure of thyroid hormone action in tissue. So, so that's been actually an important kind of project, but it also, it's a segue to tell you that in Europe, there's a lot more going on than in the US. The US, not just during the Trump administration. Um, <clears throat> I was, I was um, working on UN committees during the Obama administration and the US State Department was just as industry friendly and science aversive as, um, I, I'm not gonna say as the Trump administration because I don't really know, but, um, but we've, we've got a lot of work to do in this country. So, so I want to switch now to talk about the debates over these regulations. I've got a quote here from Arlene Bloom. I'm, I don't know if you've talked about, about her in the class, but Arlene is a, is a fascinating person who has done incredible work, including leading the first all-female ascent of K2. She, was, she spent much of her life as a, as a kind of mountain mountain climber. So her point was to me in a conversation I had with her was that if there's some proposal to change the rules that affect the way chemicals are regulated broadly, the whole industry is going to come out to stop it. And so oftentimes uh, NGOs will focus more narrowly. It's much more difficult to change the rules. And so if they want to be effective, they essentially <clears throat> will have a much more narrow focus so that the whole industry doesn't come out. The European Commission has been charged because of two laws that were, that were signed into action several years ago um, to focus on endocrine disruptors um, the people in, in Europe are much more, I think, knowledgeable and concerned about what these effects are. They, the, the European Commission has this, 
has this definition of endocrine disruptors that's actually very interesting. It says that they're chemicals that may interfere with the hormone system. The word may should be stricken, but um, interfere with the hormone system is the way the endocrine society defines an endocrine disruptor. And it's not the way the World Health Organization defines it, which is, I think, an important clue that the European Commission, or at least people within the European Commission, um, are thinking about what the issues are. Now, in 2012, I was part of a group that published this document that was that was really funded by the UN Environment Program and the World Health Organization. And <clears throat> the goal of this was to provide an update because the first document like this, the State of the Science of Endocrine Disrupting Chemicals was published in 2002. So, so our goal was to just review the literature of the past 10 years at that time. One of the things that's really important here in this document is that in 2002, the description of the endocrine system is what the industry thinks about hormones. Here you've got this kind of seesaw. If A goes down, B comes up, and that returns it to some kind of homeostasis. If B goes down, A goes up, and it'll return it to homeostasis. So they explicitly made the point that the endocrine system is designed by evolution to allow us to adapt to the environment, which also means chemicals that are completely unnatural. That's their implication. In contrast, in 2012, <clears throat> Jerry Heindel and I wrote the first chapter, and we focused on how hormones act on receptors and how that action follows certain rules. And these are rules that everybody understands. So as a result, we came up with very different kind of conclusions. Well, a group that was funded by a variety of industries, not just a single industry, but you know, the pesticides, the plastic industry, et cetera, et cetera, came up with this, you know, very critical comments on the work that we had done. In, in response to this, we responded by saying that and it, this paper is actually, it's, it's difficult to read because it's a very scholarly approach to how, you know, the science can be um, kind of, kind of, you know, the way that, the way that chemical industry analyze the science is fallacious, but it's very cleverly fallacious. Andreas Kordenkamp was one of the one of the really prime intellectuals in that response, but all of the people, um, in fact, Bruce Blumberg, you've heard some of these people, Bruce and Laura Vandenberg, who will come next. So this, you know, two kind of high level groups are battling in the literature over what's real and what's not real. And as a result, the European Commission, which at the time um, was under a lawsuit that was submitted by Sweden to make them make decisions about how they're going to regulate endocrine disruptors. They organized this conference on June 1st, 2015 <clears throat> to essentially, in principle, to um, you know, get a sense of what's real and what's not real. You can actually go to this site to see that, that uh, conference. Now, I was representing the Endocrine Society. I was the first speaker that morning. And this was organized by this guy, Ladislav Niko, that I had met with a couple of times before. And I, I mean, he, he, um, he was definitely an industry person. So, so I presented, I think they were 10 minute talks. 
first representing the Endocrine Society, Daniel Dietrich, really presented the industry side of this. Now, in my presentation, I focused on hormone action. I was talking about how receptors work. I showed this graph relating <clears throat> ligand concentration with, um, I'll talk about this in a minute later, because it has tremendous implications, and talking about how the cr critical features of hormone action, they have to be considered by regulators. In the, the point that I wanted to make here and that I made in that, that presentation is that this graph is showing the relationship between hormone concentration and receptor number. So <clears throat> this was an experiment where receptor number was artificially controlled experimentally in a cell line, and then they were exposed to different concentrations of the ligand. So if you just take one concentration of ligand and go up, you can see that the, the effect, the response of the cell is dependent upon receptor number. You can also go this way where you pick a response. And as you go across here, it requires less and less lower and lower concentration of hormone to produce the same effect as hormone concentrate as receptor concentration increases. This is incredibly important because it explains why the same ligand can have different effects in different tissues. One tissue is going to be relatively insensitive. One tissue can be exquisitely sensitive because of differences in receptor number. This is well known. This is not even new. So Dietrich gets up <clears throat> and shows this this graph here showing the competitive binding assay. So this is all in vitro and it's just showing, you know, differences in the affinity of steroids, pharmaceuticals, uh, pesticides and industrial chemicals and basically making the point that these manufactured chemicals really have a very low affinity for this receptor. And in a debriefing, I had written a comment on this that <clears throat> these binding isotherms are correct, but his implication and his clear implication to the audience was that affinity equals potency. And he knows that's not true. The efficacy of a specific ligand on the ER is endpoint specific, and we know that. In fact, the FDA has shown in their studies that BPA is 120,000 times more potent in the developing brain than on the rat uterus, which is 12 times greater than the difference in binding affinity of BPA for the ER alpha compared to E2. This is just not a debate. So the funny part about it was during the coffee break, this guy comes up to me who happened to be the head of Cephic. Cephic is the voice of, this is from their website. This is, they're the voice of the chemical industry in Europe. And he comes up to me and he says, how are we going to resolve all these differences? And I was pissed by that time because it, it galls me when science is being, you know, really, really kind of not misunderstood, but, but blatantly fabricated. And I said, you know, if you put us all in the same room, we'd come out with a consensus and it would be exactly what I was talking about. So the next day I flew to Stockholm because Oka Bergman, who <clears throat> is a well-known chemist there, had set up, had arranged for a meeting with the Swedish government. Now the Swedish government at the time had this lawsuit against Brussels because of their their you know, lack of focus in, in um, living up to, the, to their kind of legal requirements. <clears throat> and, and Oka had also arranged for several of us to have a dinner cruise in Lake Malloran outside of Stockholm. This is Oka here. This is Sue Jobling and Andreas Kortenkamp, both of, 
uh, Brunel University. And during this dinner, we had this conversation about trying to have a consensus meeting to bring the toxicologists, the industry people together with endocrinologists and hammer out a genuine consensus about what the basic biology is. Now, Oka is so well connected to government officials that he got up from the table, made a phone call and came back and said, okay, it started. Now it took quite a while. The Swedish government began to contact other governments. It turns out that Germany decided that they would completely pay for that consensus meeting. This was the paper that came from that. So it's the scientific principles for the identification of endocrine disruptive, disrupting chemicals, a consensus statement. There's two things that I've highlighted here. The first is we acknowledge that certain hormones, I can't believe I let the term certain because there isn't a hormone where this isn't true, interact with their receptors according to an equilibrium reaction. Accordingly, the concentrations of both free hormone and free variables controlling hormone action, explaining why different cells and tissues at different times during development are differentially sensitive to the hormone. Then we agree that a chemical's potency to induce an adverse effect is an important factor for consideration during the characterization of hazard <clears throat> in a risk assessment, that's the implication, but potency is not relevant for the identification of a compound as an endocrine disruptor. That's a hugely important statement. And when everybody voted for that, I was really happy. Now, I've highlighted three people here, Dietrich, this guy Helmut Grime, and Alan Bubis. Those three guys all signed this statement. But they went to Brussels right after that meeting and talked to the, the commissioner of health and food safety to basically argue against everything they had just agreed to. And this became so well known that a, a investigative reporter, Stefan Harrell, um, wrote this piece called The Toxic Affair, how the chemical lobby blocked action on hormone disruptive chemicals. And it, she says, it shows how industry has successfully used classic tactics and that <clears throat> some civil servants, even though employed in the services of char in charge of public health, seem to have corporate interest over public ones. And I think that's, that's an understatement. She's being very cautious there, but that's an understatement. It's clear both in, both in the US and also in Europe that there are people who have important impact on regulations that have, have more affinity to industry than to public health protection. Um, okay, so the big issue here in Europe is that these two laws that, that the European Commission was, was working under moves the situation to a hazard-based exclusion. That is, if a chemical is identified as an endocrine disruptor, it can't be licensed. Now, there's some caveats, but they're actually pretty strong. So that this hazard-based analysis means that potency is not relevant and industry hates this because risk assessment is a process by which chemicals that are bad for us can continue to be used because they can sort of play with the numbers. Even recently, <clears throat> the same group, Bubis, Dietrich, Descant is in there. Descant, I heard a story, I don't know if it's true, that he was invited to come to the Berlin consensus meeting, but didn't want to be trapped by making a consensus with people with about the basic science. They wrote this, this article largely to influence the European Commission that human exposure to synthetic chemicals is generally negligible as compared to natural compounds. So 
So first of all, this is all about dose response. That's the first thing. And secondly, it's just wrong. <clears throat> instead of, instead of you know, arguing with them, which really, I think, uh, produced problems for us previously, uh, Stefan Horel and Stefan Foucard investigated these people and basically this group of toxicologists who had written this, these people are basically not experts in endocrine disruption. Most of them hadn't published anything in relation to endocrine disruption. Most of them, few of them have ever done any basic kind of work. So why are scientists most of whom receive funding or personal payments from industry, willing to spin the science. That's something that I struggle with. In the meantime, what's happening? Um, Leo Trasande and others wrote this paper. This is kind of the, you know, it's, it's one of the most recent papers of the series of articles that calculates the economic costs, not just the human impact. What, what would, you know, to what extent would 10 IQ points affect each of you? Um, so this is saying, what, what effect does it have on our societies? Yesterday in EHN, this, this uh, article was published, Food Dyes Linked to Attention and Activity Problems. We were talking about this when I was in college in the 1970s, and we've still got it in this country because uh, we don't have a regulatory system that really cares about us. So, so to kind of sum up here, I think one of the things we have to do is change the narrative about regulations. Regulations aren't bad. Who would want to watch a football game if you didn't have referees? It's the same thing here. We have to have rules. And we have to play by those rules, and those rules need to be protecting the players, i.e. us. Government regulators are now captured by the regulated community and not, no, I don't think there's any better place to see that than FDA food safety. Individuals in industry and government have to be held to account for the human suffering that they inflict. <clears throat> we sue companies, the government sues companies. My brother is an attorney for the Justice Department in the Environmental Enforcement Division He's got a big case in Chicago now. There's nobody who's going to pay the price. The industry might. There's going to be some, you know, money that has to change hands, but it's industry money. It's not individuals going to jail because they knowingly hurt people. We also need to reduce exposures really in two ways. We need to limit exposure at the beginning, but we also have to try to get rid of the chemicals that are currently here because they're not gonna go away quickly. Um, and this is something that Terry, I know, has been intimately involved in and it's a, it's a hugely important thing. So I'll go ahead and stop there um, and hope that this can stimulate some conversation. Well, uh, Tom, um, first of all, thank you. I, I mean, this, this, guys, was, this was an extraordinary lecture. I mean, all of the themes that you've seen in the class came together here, uh, but in, with a really beautiful aspect that it was wrapped around, actually the deep science was well explained um, of the thyroid system. And you got to see somebody who really understands as well as anyone does on earth, how the, how the thyroid system works and how the chemical enterprise and governments uh, interact with that understanding and unfortunately pervert it uh, to protect the money. So I also I, have I, to say that, that <clears throat> I work on thyroid hormone because I was raised Catholic, so I can't work on sex. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Excuse me. I, I may have trouble stopping laughing over that. Um, so, all right, ladies and gentlemen of the class, uh, do we have any questions for, for Dr. Zola or any comments?
Well, I know these things take a long time to digest. Um, and let me, tell, let me tell you something, at least if you're like me, you have to get sort of clubbed over the head with them about 10 to 20 times before, oh, okay. <laughs> it, it really, it really, it, it's very difficult to integrate it, something this, this powerful um, on the spot. Yeah, so but, one, um, yeah, go ahead, Adrian. Oh, um, I was just gonna say, so you talked about uh, regulations for identifying what is considered an endocrine disruptor and what we should do about that. And they were based on experimental data, right? Um, is there any, I don't know if this is maybe not your topic, but uh, our topic of research, but is there any work being done on identifying endocrine disruptors before the molecule is actually synthesized, like identifying what causes certain molecular structures to be disruptive? It's a good question. So, so in Athena, now in Athena, we're just focused on thyroid, but the very first project is all in silico, identify chemicals that interact with any one of these proteins. So for example, the thyroid hormone receptor, but diiodinases, et cetera, et cetera. And that's a large project. It would be, you know, there is, there is a lot of focus on trying to identify chemicals before they're synthesized. That hasn't, you know, <clears throat> there's, there's two logics that you can apply here. One logic is, okay, so let's try to find a chemical that doesn't have, you know, that, that doesn't appear to have some kind of structure that's gonna be a problem. Uh, we can do that simply, or not simply, but quickly and less, less expensively in silico. Okay, so now we run through, you know, we do some tests on safety, but the, the, way, the, regula the way the regulatory system is set up, and I was kind of reading the, the EPA's website on the EDSP this morning, and you know their logic is that just because a chemical interacts in silico, just because a chemical interacts in vitro or in animals, doesn't mean it's going to hurt people. We have to know all these other things. And so it's this it's this decades long investigation of a single chemical that is is just not sustainable. This is why we're in the situation today. What we should be saying is, if it, if it hits a target in silico, don't use it. Don't make it, don't use it. If you find something that appears clean, but it hits a target in vitro, don't use it. Use something else. We've got to change the logic where a chemical is innocent until you prove it guilty. But how do you prove it guilty? You know, right now, the, the, EPA has stated formally, and I don't think it's been withdrawn yet, that we can't use epidemiological studies because people are exposed to so many different things, you can't prove it was that chemical. So even if, even if there's a link between a chemical like chlorpyrifos and adverse outcome in humans, they can't use it. So and they and they also say that you can't use like a completely controlled lab rat study because it's not humans. It's not relevant. <laughs> my, yeah, it's a, it's yeah, my my comment on that, which I definitely like sure you agree with, is that I think it shouldn't even be relevant whether or not we do a test on whether it affects humans. If it affects animals, we already shouldn't be releasing that into okay. the environment. Yeah. even if it somehow magically is completely healthy for people. Yeah, right. Yeah. It's frustrating. I mean, the, the arguments are well honed and the, the regulators are well trained to be sensitive to those arguments. I mean, I've thought a lot about this and I kind of think one, one issue is that both regulators and you know, the chemical industry toxicologists all went to toxicology training at the same grad schools. 
they know each other. They're the, the godfather of kids and, you know, et cetera. It's, it's a system that has been, has been lubricated by a lot of money. So one of the uh, important themes in this is that it, a decision was made in the United States to um, balance, so shall we say, the science, the science against the cash flows. And so R Ronald Reagan in introduced a rule that prior to uh, him doing so, uh, this principle of like of government reaction towards problematic chemicals um, uh, was, was not in effect. And that is that um, if, what, after you build your case on the science that this chemical should be regulated in some way, you then have to, I've, I've told you this before, but it's worth repeating, troop over to an office if you're the regulatory uh, people in the uh, executive building beside the White House and talk to this person to try to persuade them that um, it really should go. And you have to have your uh, economic analysis uh, there with it. And he has the right to say, well, no, I don't think that's worth, uh, worth uh, the cost to the economy. Uh, the problem is this person has absolutely no scientific training. He's making the decisions based effectively on uh, the negative impact on, on the economy. And so money wins every step of the way. And that is lethal uh, to appropriate regulatory uh, posture towards uh, uh, chemicals and especially endocrine disruptors. W would you comment on that, Tom? Yeah, there's kind of a lot of levels <clears throat> there. One of them is this idea of, of how you do that that economic analysis. For example, during the Obama administration, they could reduce mercury um, effluent from stacks because they included all of the chemicals that are being taken out of the effluent of the, <clears throat> you know, that's put into the atmosphere in their chemical analysis. So, if you just looked at mercury, so these were, these were, you know, scrubbers that were put on smokestacks to reduce mercury, but they also reduced a lot of other things. And the sum total of all that was being reduced had a much greater economic impact. Well, the Trump administration turned that around and said, we're only going to look at, it's not fair to look at everything. You only have to look at mercury. So they released you know, they overturned that Obama era kind of thing. The, the you know, the issues here um, wind up being really complicated. A story that my brother told me once is that he had a case in West Virginia where a company was spewing a lot of benzene into the atmosphere, much greater than <clears throat> what the EPA regulated. And the EPA took him to court and to develop their case, they put these sensors on the top of the smokestack that were Wi-Fi enabled and would, would give a readout every 10 seconds of how much benzene is being put into the atmosphere. Well, the TSCA regulation, the law that was written, explained how EPA should collect data, and that is they should send a person to the company who would physically observe how much black smoke is coming out and rank that. And so in the, in the courtroom, the, uh, the judge essentially uh, you know, canceled the case because they hadn't used the 1970s definition of how you identify benzene. So, you know, there, there are so many, there are so many ways that industry can get around this, none of which is good natured, none of which is in good faith. <clears throat> the, the problem I had on the Ed stack was I assumed everybody was acting in good faith. You know, the EPA likes to have 
what they call kind of a balance. We need to have all these different stakeholders. But when half the room comes from different industries, they're all in it together. So it's not, it's not a fair playing field. And, and one needs to also think, I think you'd agree, Tom, that the amount of money behind this subterfuge to keep chemicals in the marketplace is astronomical. And the scientists who find and can speak to the dangers really don't have big budgets to go and lobby Congress and no. uh, get their opinion across. Uh, Plus, when we do lobby Congress, we go for a day. And the lobbyists are there every day, 24-7. Yeah, so we're looking at a we're looking at a failing system. There is no doubt about it. We're looking at a civilization that will, if it does not figure out how to listen to incredible wisdom, such as you've heard this morning from Dr. Zola, um, is toast. It's gone, finito, uh, and quickly. You can see this from the impact of chemicals on reproductive health. Benito. So, again, uh, my hope is that that that, and certainly from the essays that I'm I'm reading from you guys, you you have you have all of the skills and power uh, to bring about change. And if you think about trying to bring it about where wherever you are, you might like to look to Carnegie Mellon because the big achievement of the last years of, Car of Carnegie Mellon and sustainability is um, expanded recycling. That's the biggest single achievement. And that's just a joke. And so if you, if you want to communicate with Carnegie Mellon um, and uh, uh, tell them the kind of things you're learning from, from people like Dr. Zola need to be paid attention to, even within Carnegie Mellon, we're building all of these buildings, we're putting in the same God awful outgassing plastics and everything else every time we do it. We never learn. So there you go. Um, any anything more, Tom, that you would like to say in closing? We're right on time. Well, it's been it's been an honor for me to be able to talk to you all about this. It's clearly something that is important to me, and it's really nice to be able to share that. And I wish you all the best of luck. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, everybody. Let's give those with their, with their cameras on. Let's give <laughs> Dr. Zola a big clap. And uh, thank you for this really wonderful 80 minutes, uh, Tom. Okay, now we have we meet on Thursday for the last class uh, with Laura Vandenberg. See you then. <laughs>